Welcome to our prayer meeting tonight, our devotional thought. Sounds rather strange for a Bible study, but uh, our prayer meeting, I should say. Samaria receives the Word of God, and we'll be looking at Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Samaria receives the Word of God. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he, was, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. In studying the Bible, it's important to let the text speak to us in the context of the time in which it was written and to let it teach us what it teaches. So, that might sound rather strange, but it is important if we want to understand what the text is telling us. There is the tendency for people to read into the text a particular doctrine that was formulated sometime, some centuries after the event in the text, and that's happened a lot to this particular text. Rather than reading a particular doctrine into the event that happened in Samaria, let us allow the passage to teach us what it teaches. Now remember, this passage was written by the evangelist Luke as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. Let us learn what the Spirit has to teach rather than reading a certain doctrine into the event that may or may not be correct. Is that in chapter 3 or chapter 8? I said chapter 8. Okay. All right. Now, as simple as this passage appears, believe it or not, it is a source of dispute and disagreement even among Christians that believe the same thing about receiving the Holy Spirit. Even eradicationists don't fully agree on what happened in Samaria on this particular day. Philip the Evangelist had just preached the gospel to the Samaritans and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. That's what it says in verse 6. So this certainly suggests that they had just become Christians. Now keep in mind, Jesus had preached in Samaria, and his teaching was readily accepted among the Samaritans. Okay? Um, but, you know, that was before the cross. That was before there was any Christianity. So these apparent Christians had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John came down from Jerusalem, laid hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit. The facts are plain, but explanations can be confusing. First, we understand that to be a Christian, one must be born again and consequently have the Holy Spirit because to be born again is to be born of the Spirit according to the teaching of Jesus in the third chapter of John's Gospel. But yet these people lacked something which most eradicationists insist is the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the eradication or purging of inherited sin. This is a passage that eradicationists used as a proof text for their teaching on the second work of grace. Arguments on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, and all else aside, okay? Put all that aside. It must be remembered that this is early in the book of Acts. And there are important dispensational and demographic issues that have to be considered when explaining what happened here. And that's how you find out the true context. What happened there? First, the expression 
as he had fallen on none of them, has to be taken into consideration. What does that mean? Okay? It means and specifically refers to how the Holy Spirit came on the church in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Remember, this is all new in the world. It isn't just Christianity. It's a new moving of God. And the first moving of God under the gospel after the crucifixion and resurrection was the day of Pentecost. And what happened there? Okay? Hey, there were you know, like tongues of fire that came on the people. And they spoke in, in languages that they had never studied, okay? So it was very dramatic, okay? So there were unusual visual and auditory evidences of the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans now had become Christians, but they did not have this particular manifestation of the Holy Spirit until Peter and John laid hands on them. Okay? They received the gospel when Philip preached, right? That's what it says. What does that mean? Well, they accepted the gospel. They became Christians. All right? But uh, they had not had this unusual manifestation of the Holy Spirit until Peter and John came down and laid hands on them. So, with that in mind, the dispensational issue has to be taken into account first. Up to this time, salvation had been experienced through the law of Moses until the day of Pentecost when the dispensation changed and Christian salvation became reality. It was necessary for people to be saved under the law to experience the born-again experience now as Jesus taught it. Okay, they were already saved under the law of Moses. But because the dispensation changed, they had to move into the gospel dispensation and have that born-again experience as Jesus taught. All right? Demographics are also most important in understanding people receiving the Holy Spirit in these early pages of the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, the church which consisted of people that were saved under the law of Moses, received the Holy Spirit, bringing about the new birth, which is being born of the Spirit as Jesus taught. Now, here in our lesson, we have Samaritans. And you know who those people are, don't you? Apostates from Judaism and despised by the Jews. We have these people receiving the gospel, okay? Then receiving the Holy Spirit in some semblance of the way the church received him. What this evidence shows is that Christian salvation was obtainable by the Samaritans just as it was for the Jews. God was making a point by doing it this way with the Samaritans. On the day of Pentecost, you had the church, which is mostly Jewish people who were Christians now, receiving the Holy Spirit. All right? You have the Samaritans who were despised by the Jews and rejected by the Jews. And keep in mind, the church was largely Jews at this time. God had to show to them that he accepted the Samaritans with the gospel. And it wasn't just enough in the knowledge of God that they accepted the gospel as presented to them by Philip. God knew that there had to be this manifestation of the Holy Spirit coming on them. And that's why Peter and John came down, they laid hands on them, and that happened. Now, they didn't have the tongues of fire, but they did have the other manifestation. God is showing these Jewish Christians, look, these Samaritans are now Christians. They're now born again. They now have the Holy Spirit, just like you do. There's no difference, okay? Thank the Lord for that, okay? Then in the 10th chapter of Acts, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that? Cornelius, we are told, was a devout man. He was a devout man. He was a Gentile. He was a Roman officer living there in Judea. 
Okay? Now, he was devout. What did that mean? Well, he was accepting God as it was revealed to him through the Jewish religion. Now, he couldn't go to the synagogue. He couldn't go to the temple because he was a Gentile. But he was a devout man. And when he received the Holy Spirit, it showed the Jews that salvation was attainable by the Gentiles, people that were as despised by the Jews as were the Samaritans. So who was there on the day when those Gentiles received the Holy Spirit? Anybody remember who was there? Peter. And what was Peter's ethnic background? He was a Jew. <laughs> he was a Jew. <laughs> okay. Now, it's important that we understand that because Peter was there on the day of Pentecost. Right? He experienced this. He happened to be there in Samaria when he and John laid hands on these people and the Holy Spirit came on them. He witnessed that as a Jew, seeing that God accepted the Samaritans with Christian salvation. And now Peter, this Jewish man, is there in this Gentile home and they are devout people, but now they receive the Holy Spirit showing him that they are indeed Christians accepted by God and filled with the Spirit of God. That's important. And you need to take that into consideration as you uh, study what's going on in these incidences. And be careful how you draw doctrines out of them. They aren't necessarily there for the purpose of defining doctrines. They're there to show us how God accepted into the New Testament dispensation all these people of different backgrounds that were at enmity with each other and enemies and now are made one under the gospel and given the Holy Spirit by God. Then finally, in the 19th chapter of Acts, we see some disciples of John the Baptist receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the little small group of people that were left out, okay? They weren't there on the day of Pentecost. They weren't Samaritans. Uh, they may or may not have been Gentiles. But these are people who had accepted the teaching of John the Baptist, okay? They were devout men. But they did not receive, had yet have the fullness of the gospel message. So you recall that they did not even know about the Holy Spirit being essential to salvation. Remember the conversation Peter had with them? He said, well, what were you guys baptized to then if you don't know about the Holy Spirit? John's baptism. They weren't aware that the Holy Spirit was involved in salvation. So now they listened to Paul and his explanation. And they received the Holy Spirit under Paul's teaching and completed what was necessary for them to have Christian salvation. So early in the book of Acts, you see how God deliberately moved okay, with the first Jewish Christians, then the Samaritans, the Gentiles, and then this little group of devout people that were kind of halfway in between to bring them all into the gospel dispensation. So, from that we see in our text that it has absolutely nothing to do with sanctification or eradication of inherited sin. Instead, it shows the transition of people from the Old Testament dispensation into the New Testament dispensation. And if we let these passages teach what they teach, we will find it much easier to understand what the New Testament does teach on salvation and entire sanctification. Whatever doctrines or explanations are made, it is essential that all believers know that they have been born of the Spirit and are filled with His presence. You need to know that. You must know that. 
Now, you probably did not have an experience similar to the Samaritans. Anybody here have an experience like that? I certainly didn't. What is important for you to know is that you have received the gospel, that you have repented your sin, and that you've been born again through the working of the Holy Spirit in your own spirit. Outward signs are not necessary. You know, flames of fire, not necessary. Speaking in, an, in, a, in another language is not necessary. Shouting and hollering is not necessary. Okay, uh, what is necessary is that you know for certain that your sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit is ministering grace to your life that helps you to live a holy life as God intends you to live. Amen.